So today we are joined by Professor Sasha Kimmel, who is an assistant professor in the psychology department at CSU San Marcos. Professor Kimmel's work um, addresses really difficult questions, um, including uh, cross-cultural influences upon psychology and the psychology of intergroup conflict. Uh, her talk today is entitled Meatborne Xenophobia, Understanding When Discuss Fuels Outgroup Hate. So thank you very much for joining us today, Sasha, and welcome to Beck. Great, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I wanna actually start by acknowledging Jim Sedanius, who some of you might know, he was a faculty member at UCLA for many years um, in the psychology department before he went to Harvard. Um, he was a collaborator on this project with me. And um, actually I have another collaborator here who you'll meet in a little bit. And he was my postdoc advisor at Harvard. So. Um, and then two, he actually gave a talk at Beck um, in 2018, which was really cool to see. And I feel really honored to be here. And I think he'd be really um, excited to hear that I was giving a talk at this at the series as well. So his stuff was on social dominance orientation, and he was really excited about his work on um, theories of gendered prejudice. And so that's what he spoke to folks about uh, about four years ago. So I am a social psychologist and I, as um, Brian said, I do work on cultural psychology and I'll kind of address this a little bit at the end if we have time. And then intergroup relations, which is more what I'm gonna be talking about today. And inspire um, my lab's culture and intergroup relations lab. So just the combination of those two things. I have two lab members here actually. And so hopefully you'll get to meet them as well. Um, Fatih, who's here, he um, started doing some work, or he was doing some work on uh, Islamophobia, so related to intergroup threat, and I got involved with that, and then some of our other collaborators, Jonas and, and Milan, also do work on Islamophobia and various intergroup threats, and so even though I wasn't doing this kind of work as my primary line, it inspired me to pursue this in terms of disgust, but disgust is a completely new area for me. Um, and just to be really forthcoming, it's been super complex. I've found the disgust literature. Sorry, my um, I have a dual monitor and it's oddly cutting out so I can't see all of a sudden. Um, shoot. Okay, I can see you again, great. Um, so discussed, the discussed literature I've found to be very complicated, um, but actually surprisingly to myself, I've gotten really excited about it. Um, in fact, I had another primary line of research, which I'll maybe address that kind of had to shut down because of COVID. And I'm thinking that I really wanna invest a lot of my time in discuss going forward because I have enjoyed it so much and found it to be so important. So that said, this is a you know new area for me. I don't feel like I know the discussed literature that well, although I've been in the midst of COVID just reading a bunch of review articles. Um, I have not really spoken to actually anyone about this work in many um, years. Um, in fact, Fati, my collaborator here, hasn't even seen this framing of the work. It's something I've really just been kind of like working on alone in my living room here. Um, so I'd really appreciate your feedback on the framing and the theoretical contribution. I am hoping to publish this very soon. Um, I am working on writing the manuscript um, and the framing that I have here is how I'm thinking to frame it right now and how I've kind of started framing it. But again, really would appreciate your feedback because this is just something I've been thinking about a lot to myself and actually haven't shared with anyone yet. So, as Brian said, um, the talks on meatborne white xenophobia um, and understanding when disgust fuels outgroup hate. So I want to start by sharing some responses to graphic news articles about dog and rat meat from UK residents. I'm going to show you the whole quote in just a minute. So for now, just I want to point out the word that it says sick. Um, then with the next one, it's disgusting and I don't want any more diseases. So if we think about the evolved function of disgust, a lot of research suggests that it's about avoidance of pathogens and parasites. And that meat 
is a particularly um, you know intense uh, I'm forgetting the word but like has a particularly high levels of pathogen parasite parasites in it and so it, it makes sense it's not surprising that taboo meat which has high levels of pathogens and parasites would evoke disgust but when we look at these quotes more broadly and i'll read them to you in a second what it says is something this sick makes me appreciate every last indonesian that got pulled out to sea in the last tsunami and this one, China, please start behaving like human beings and stop eating rats. It's disgusting. And I don't want any more diseases affecting the civilized world. And so when I looked at these, there's a lot of these are Daily Mail articles and that's the comment sections. You see so many comments like this. So this leads to the question of, you know, it's unsurprising that the meat itself would evoke disgust. But when does disgust actually fuel outgroup hate? And I'm using the term outgroup hate here for simplicity. And I'm going to, I'm using it to refer to a bunch of extreme negative and attitudinal behavioral outcomes, such as dehumanization and third party punishment and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll talk more about that when I get to my measures. So, correlational research suggests that trait disgust, so an individual difference measure, and outgroup hate that the correlation between these appears to be particularly strong when disease threat is present, when there's um, either, you know, a measure of trait disgust that's particularly tapping into pathogens, or on the other hand, without group hate, assessing pathogen related behavior like cannibalism. So the, the, the fact correlationally appears to be particularly strong when disease threat is present. In addition, there's some experimental evidence suggesting that when you induce disgust, such as priming germs, so with the disease threat, that outgroup hate appears to be potentially increased. However, um, and I'll get to this in a second, but there's there's also some work and it's it's complicated, but around whether also morality threat can also serve as an effective disgust induction to influence outgroup hate. And there's a lot of theorizing on this and some research to suggest that that yes, this is possible. But what's less known, is whether the combined effect of disease threat and immorality can lead to outgroup hate. So given that disease threat is closely related to disgust, as well as immorality threat, it's possible that these two things combined might particularly exacerbate outgroup hate. Some evidence from this comes from what people refer to as like taboo sex. So um, this is often assessed with like gay sex or um other norm, non-normative sex sexes <laughs> um so a lot of people think about taboo sex and, and gay sex as a disease threat but it's also often considered a threat to traditional immorality and so if we make an inference from this what we can see is that um you know using taboo sex as this kind of placeholder for disease threat and immorality threat, trait disgust, so this individual difference measure of disgust, appears to be particularly strongly correlated to outgroup hate when taboo sex is involved. So for instance, if there's an individual difference measure like disgust sensitivity, outgroup hate, when that's higher, outgroup hate is higher for like people who are queer, for instance, so homophobia measures. And that effect is particularly strong um, compared to when other groups are looked at. In addition, there's a lot of experimental work and actually the most consistent experimental work on the impact of induced disgust on outgroup hate appears to come from the area of taboo sex. So what this is potentially suggesting is that this disease threat plus this immorality threat might particularly exacerbate outgroup hate. And what I'm interested in is the relative contribution of both disease threat and morality, immorality threat. So one way that I, or the way that I looked at this, and I think a, a valuable way to look at this is in the context of meat eating. Um, so meat is, it provides a really interesting context for this since 
within the U.S. context, we have normative meat, um, meat that's largely neutral within the U.S., so cows and or, or beef and pork and chicken. These are meats that, at least for meat eaters, tend to be relatively neutral, not high in disgust, not high in immorality. So we have this comparison condition when we look at meat. Um, however, there's also meats that are considered highly taboo within the US context. For instance, um, a dog, a particularly cared for animal. And research, recent research suggests that dogs are considered, or dog meat is considered a disease threat, but particularly an immorality threat. Whereas other animals such as detested ones like rats are considered not an immorality threat, but a disease threat primarily. So what's what I wanted to test was whether taboo meat from a cared for animal such as dog might particularly increase outgroup hate and whether taboo meat from a detested animal such as a rat might to a lesser extent. So in study one, um, and this was, I'll just, um, I want to mention that it is, was collected before COVID. This data was before 2018. This is, um, we used what's called D-Labs. It's this pool, it's online non-student participant pool at, at Harvard, um, but it's people throughout the U.S. And so this is what they, I just pulled this off their website today, but this was their data in 2018 of where their participants come from. So it's relatively well distributed across the US, but importantly, there's been some research um, by, by the folks running it suggesting that it's um, either as representative or even they say maybe more representative than MTurk. So we use this primarily in all our studies. We did use some other online non-student participant pools, um, but majority of the data came from, from D-Labs. And so we told, Participants, this was a study about international cuisine. We had some filler measures and stuff like that. And in the main um, manipulation, what we had was we had this, this image of this guy and he was pre-tested or, or pre-validated to, um, so that he was racially ambiguous, racially and ethically ambiguous. And then we also came up with the culture Telistrian and the food Balfusum, which were also pre-tested to be, or actually validated to be culturally and, and um, regionally ambiguous. So it says, this is a picture of a man from the Telistrian culture eating Balfusum. Balfusum is a traditional Telistrian delicacy made from seared, and then we randomly, um, assign them to either the beef condition, the rat or the dog condition, meritated a seasonal blend of local spaces. So then we assessed meat baits discussed as a, a manipulation check. Um, this is the standard or one of the standard ways of assessing disgust. And it, it does include grossed out, which some folks argue may be getting at pathogen threat. And what you can see is this is just testing to make sure that, that um, that the experiment worked in the way that we thought it would, you can see that compared to beef, that both rat and dog were considered more disgusting to eat. And that there was actually no difference between the rat and dog condition. And I actually just looked back at the Rosen data where he, he also had rat and dog conditions looking at um, the eating of them. And it was the same. They didn't have a cow condition, but dogs and rats were were perceived to be as disgusting to eat. So, so that's um, in line with their effects. And then we wanted to look at care for the harmed for the harmed animal. So this was a five item measure, but some examples are, I feel sorry for the animal that was slaughtered to produce balfusum, or I felt pity for this animal. So really getting at compassion for the harmed animal. And you can see that here, um, Beef um, or cow, um, and I'll, get, I'll talk more about that in a moment, but um, was significantly different from the dog condition. So dogs were particularly more cared for unsurprisingly. And in fact, a lot of research suggests that dogs are one of the most cared for beings. Even some people care for dogs more than humans. Um, and 
that there was also a significant difference between the rat and dog condition. So unsurprisingly, rats um, were much less cared for than dogs, but there was no difference between the beef and the rat condition. This too largely uh, matches Rosen's data on the immorality of eating the animals. So here, now we wanted to look at the dependent measures. So one thing we looked at was intergroup disgust. This was an eight item measure, but some examples are, I'd feel disgusted if someone from the Telestrian cultural group invaded my personal space, or after interacting with someone from the Telestrian cultural group, I would desire more contact with my own ethnic group to undo any ill effects of intergroup contact. And then here you can see that what really had the effect was the dog condition. So compared to beef, the neutral meat, um, randomly assigning them to perceive the other cultures eating dog meat appeared to increase intergroup disgust. However, rat meat did not. Then similarly, if we look at outgroup dehumanization, this is a measure by um, one, of, one of the folks that was at uh, Harvard with, with Fati and I. Um, it says some people think that people can vary in how human-like they seem. According to this view, some people seem highly evolved, whereas others seem no different than lower animals. Using this sliding scale below, indicate how evolved you consider people from the Telestrian cultural group to be. And so, right, more human, less human, and shockingly, this measure works really well, although it's quite intense. Um, and what you can see here is that same with the, as in the intergroup discussed um, DV, it's the differences between the bat, the beef and the rat condition, or oh, sorry, beef and the dog condition. So people are seen as less human when they're eating dog meat than beef, and there was no difference with between the beef and the rat condition. So study one is indicating that taboo meat from a cared for animal, such as a dog, relative to a neutral meat, such as beef, particularly appears to be exacerbating outgroup hate. Whereas when we looked at the tested animal, the rat versus the beef, we found no effect of or induced disgust on outgroup hate. So study two made quite a few improvements. One is we wanted to test this within a real culture that actually eats these meats. Um, we focused on Sulawesi, Indonesia. They do have um, markets there that sell dog meat and um, monkey meat. And another improvement we made is we, and you, I kind of alluded to this, but we realized that there was an issue with the beef condition. Um, the beef may disassociate the animal from its, um, from its origins, from its animal origins. Um, also using the image may disassociate it. So we got rid of, rid of that and replaced it with cow. Also, because we didn't find any effect of rat in the first study, we replaced that with monkey. And this was to kind of differentiate looking at a highly cared for animal that's domesticated versus a cared for animal non-domesticated and, and, and less cared for than a dog. Because again, dogs have been found to be highly, highly, highly cared for compared to most other animals. So we got rid of the image and here we're using this um, real cultural group called, and then here are the dishes, Indonesian slow roast. It says prepared as a main meal. This traditional delicacy from Sulawesi, Indonesia is made from a, and then we randomly send cow, monkey or dog that has been skewered down the center lengthwise with a metal rod and then slow roasted over an open fire until medium rare. Finally, it's seasoned with local spices and served whole. And so what you can see here is that there was a significant difference between all three of the meats. Um, so unsurprisingly, um, monkey meat rated more disgusting than cow meat, and then dog meat, especially more disgusting and more disgusting than monkey meat. And then when you look at care for the harmed animal, also unsurprising, dog particularly um, cared for, and more so than monkey meat, and these are both more than cow. So 
So that's just checking to see um, what the conditions are doing. Um, and so now we're looking at the, the DV. So we have the same, mostly the same measures, but I'm going to show you some new ones we included. So this is the same outgroup dehumanization measure as with the first study, except we changed the group to people from Sulawesi, Indonesia. And you can see that it's it appears to be the dog condition again relative to the cow condition that's increasing perceived outgroup dehumanization. Same thing here with intergroup discuss is the same pattern of data that we saw in study one when we had rat here. So again, it seems to be dog that's particularly increasing outgroup disgust relative to cow. Um, but then we also included some other measures. Um, we wanted to get more at behaviors and we, we did have, I'll show you a behavioral measure in a moment. Um, but one measure that helps us get at this is support for, for persecution. And this, in this um, measure, which is adapted from previous research, we changed it to imagining that you're on vacation in Indonesia. So it says, suppose that the Indonesian government sometime in the future passed a law outlining, sorry, outline, outlining the eating of this dish. Government officials then started, stated that the law would only be effective if it were vigorously enforced at the local level and appealed to people more broadly. Now imagining that you're on vacation in Indonesia, please indicate how much you agree or disagree with the following statements. So it's just seven items. Um, they ranged in extremeness. One is just, I would support a law, but on the more extreme end, there were things like, I would participate in attacks on people eating this dish organized by the proper authorities. And so here, the data looks a little bit different in that we did find an effect of the monkey condition. So cow versus monkey did increase, oops, sorry, did increase support for persecution. So when the monkey, when the other culture was represented as eating the monkey meat, increased support for persecution appeared to occur relative to the cow. And then again, same thing relative to the cow dog as well. There, there was no significant difference, however, between the monkey and the dog. Then we, as I mentioned, we wanted to look at actual behavior. So we got at this with a measure um, by previous folks that tells people that they're going to add, we're going to add their ID to various real petitions. These petitions are not actually real, um, but they're led to believe that they are. And they have the option of adding their ID to the petition, um, adding in opposition to the peti petition, or not adding it to the petition. And so it says below are recent or a number of petitions concerning a number of recent issues that have been distributed online. Although your name will remain confidential, these groups have agreed to use study pool IDs as proxies for names since study pool IDs are unique identifiers. In this case, we were using a, a, a different pool called study pool. For each of the petitions below, please indicate below whether you want your name to be added to the petition or not. So things like urge Indonesia to introduce legislation to arrest those eating this dish or fining those eating those dish. So again, various things that um, varied in the level of extremeness. And so here again, this is the same as what we saw with the um, support for punishment measure. Again, the monkey meat did um, increase people's desire to support these punitive petitions. Um, and as well as the dog condition, there was no significant effect between the dog and the monkey again. So to kind of summarize this study, it, what it's appearing is that taboo meat from a highly cared for animal, a dog, versus a neutral animal is increasing outgroup hate. And when the animal is more moderately cared for, such as a monkey, versus a cow, there is some increase in outgroup hate, but it appears to be less um, consistent. So I wanna also just note that we did run various other analyses and collected other data. Um, we have a study three, which I'm not gonna show you because it just replicates the effect of the dog versus cow condition and is the same as study, study two pretty much. 
Um, we also ran a bunch of exploratory analyses. Um, one thing we included was a measure of openness to eating various ethnically diverse cuisines. This was a new measure. Um, as far as we were able to tell, there isn't a measure of openness to eating ethnically diverse cuisines specifically, although there are measures of food neophobia. Um, and what we found is that if we treated this as an individual difference measure, which we did collect this at the very beginning before the manipulation, so this was a served as a moderator, it did appear to somewhat lessen the effect of the cared for animal on outgroup hate. So when people were more open to eating ethnically diverse cuisine, they appeared to have less outgroup hate for groups eating the cared for animal. And then we also ran some mediations and mediation moderation analyses, suggesting that meat-based disgust um, cared for the animal being eaten. We also assessed attribution of mental states um, that these may underlie this effect. So tying it together, it appears that this combination of disease threat and immorality threat may particularly fuel outgroup hate. We saw this with the dog and to a lesser extent, but still some effect with the monkey, a less cared for animal. However, the rat, which is primarily a disease threat, did not increase outgroup hate. So, these are some of the potentially new contributions of this work. And again, I'm curious to hear what you think. So previous research suggests that pathogen threat may increase outgroup hate. Um, this research appears to be suggesting that harboring something detested may not increase outgroup hate. And again, we only tested it with the rat, but so far it's providing some evidence for this. So for instance, other things that might be similar and could be tested in future research are things like sexually abusing a pedophile or cannibalism of KKK members. So things that involve both pathogen threat um, or that involve pathogen threat of a detested um, uh, being. And then when something is cared for, and when something cared for is harmed, the combined effect of pathogen threat and the morality of threat. So for instance, sexually abuse of small children or vegans' perceptions of meat eaters may especially fuel outgroup hate. There appears to be limited research on how food can impact intergroup relations. In fact, I, I at least last time I looked, I didn't, hadn't found any. Um, there is some work on interpersonal relations, um, how sharing similar foods or eating similar foods might improve friendships. Um, but it, well, I believe there isn't work, or at least there wasn't, on intergroup relations and um, particularly on the negative effects of food for intergroup relationships. And related to that, um, while there's a lot of research within Discuss that includes taboo foods, it tends to include it with other Discuss relevant themes. So it tends to combine things like eating dog meat or monkey meat with also measure or, or manipulations that include things like taboo sex or measures that also include that. And so the impact of food-based Discuss specifically appears to be largely unknown. So some limitations in some future directions. Um, one that is particularly complicated, um, there's a lot of um, controversy around the role of anger versus disgust and the role of moral outrage. Um, and so that is um, you know, definitely a, an important avenue. One is um, also the necessity of intentional harm, how important it is, um, how, how these, much these effects are driven by the actual intentional harm of the being. So how would these effects look, for instance, if the dog was accidentally killed? We tested this within a US context, and it would be really important to look at it within a non-US context, such as you know, cows for Hindu Indians. And in study three, which I didn't really get into, we actually did test an intervention to reduce the impact of disease threat and immorality threat on outgroup hate, and it didn't work. Um, but more inter, you know, effective interventions, I think, is a really important avenue. 
So I want to thank and, and thank and acknowledge my collaborators, um, Jonas, who's not here, but Fakti, who is here. Um, also, Viri, she was my lab manager. She worked on this with me. And then, of course, Jim Zedanius. And then I also want to mention that I have two students here who are involved in related work on food and intergroup relationships. Um, Brianna, who's here, and she's a grad student. Um, she's doing some work on appropriation of food. And then Alex Zare, I really wanted to introduce you to because he's actually going to be starting a PhD in social psychology at UCLA in the fall. And he is also doing work on food and intergroup relationships. So hopefully you will get to meet him in person soon. All right. That's wonderful. So yeah, and then that's pretty much, I mean, I I was going to mention that, you know, I have this various other work that I'm happy to talk about, but um, I'd be more interested to hear about your comments on, on this work. Great. Yeah. I, I'm sorry for interjecting the, no the compliment there. I, I just, no meant, I wanted to say thanks for sending these students uh, to UCLA. We all appreciate that. Um, so I, I'll, the, the floor is now open and anyone who cares to can um, raise their hand and we, we all are giving you a big virtual clap and thank you for your presentation as well <laughs> um, so so thanks a lot sasha and uh, anyone who'd like to could please raise their hand and she'll just go ahead and call on you directly so sasha it looks like we have jeff with a hand raised oh sorry it's all right uh, yeah hi jeff hi no no problem at all and um, great, great line of research, really, really interesting. Um, I, I had a couple, I guess, tactical questions. I'm, I'm wondering, listening to what you're doing, if, if two things, one, this is more about food or about killing. Um, so, you know, hunting versus eating could be, uh -huh. there could be a condition. Uh -huh. And then the second is whether we're talking about caring or, you know, caring for or something being closer to humans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thinking about looking at conditions, um, you know, that include, uh, include eating birds as an example, which, mm -hmm. you know, which are cared for, mm -hmm. uh, but are common, more commonly eaten, um, mm -hmm. or, or even testing parts of body. So, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we tend to, you know, we, we tend to relate more to our brains and hearts mm -hmm. than we do to, you know, thighs and legs. And, and I wonder if you tease yeah. those out, whether you'd get something that, that leans more towards, people's you know people's impressions about what is a more human animal or yes um, you know or a more cognitive animal yes yes and we do um i didn't get into it but we do have some exploratory data getting at that a little bit because we did um assess attribution of mental states um so we do have that for the monkey and the dog and I don't totally we looked at both intelligence and ability to feel and I don't totally remember how it looked but yeah I think that is a really important question and I even though we tend to think about monkeys as being really similar to humans I think actually people if I'm remembering correctly particularly identify with dogs um <laughs> since they're human companions. And so I think that you're right that that could be driving some of the effects. And, and yes, thank you. I think the hunting and eating point is also really good. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, AJ? Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, it's really interesting. I'm actually working on this course in my own dissertation as well. So I, I just, um, the intervention that you mentioned was particularly interesting. Um, I just, want to know um there has been some work as to how disgust is something that's embodied and can influence moral decision making mm -hmm. um and that's kind of been restricted to the realm of smells and pictures mm -hmm. um i was wondering if you uh you had any idea of how using a particular stimuli like um your the stimulus that you used in your study mm -hmm. uh, to kind of see how people track and make their own moral decisions as to how they judge that group. And um, as a further uh, extension of that, seeing how um, 
something like an antiemetic like ginger the smell of ginger can actually mm. help uh, reduce those feelings of disgust and help reduce those uh, harsh judgments of an um, out group right yeah no that's interesting um i did not i mean i i know just um on an anecdotal level that ginger is effective for um nausea uh that's something my mom always recommended but i didn't know that it has been tested as an actual intervention is that what you're you're implying oh uh, yeah that was actually a study in 2019 that uh mm -hmm. tested um like there had been studies up to that point of see uh, how disgust is embodied and how moral ju judgments mm -hmm. are usually harsh moral judgments are usually made for mm -hmm. a disgusting smell so they tried using an anti uh nausea uh, anti-nausea stimuli to see if the, the inverse was true as well and they found that it actually muted harsh judgments uh in a moral decision making task when they had exposed to the smell of ginger interesting yeah um that's really interesting we what we tried to do was um prime moral relativism and we found that that was not effective um i wouldn't have thought of something like the anti-nausea stuff because it doesn't seem at least obviously to get at the moral component but it sounds like it does and so that that could be really interesting was that your full question or did i miss something no that that was it. i just wanted to see like uh what how you you mentioned that your intervention wasn't successful i just wanted yeah. to know how the structure of it because um my work is particularly with children with autism <gasps> and um i was just um my work's kind of basic science and i'm trying to get an idea of what interventions would be good using disgust right. and seeing how it could affect moral decision making so i just wanted right. a general idea of how you had targeted that yeah so yeah we focused on um we primed moral relativism we told them about a professor we, they read an article about a professor talking about morality and how it was either uh, now it's been a while but like how morality was relative um and i or we had a control condition and we did not although the morality manipulation worked it didn't affect out group hate um and I'm guessing you know this, but the other thing I'm just thinking about when I think about disgust interventions is, is stuff on um, disgust desensitization. But I don't know a ton about that. Um, and I'm guessing you might know more. I'm, I'm still learning it as I go as well. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Daniel. Thanks, Sasha. Really interesting. Um, so just a couple of kind of um uh literature notes maybe in in light of aj's yeah. question to start with and then um some other points so um uh first i think it's important to note that priming studies in general um uh, often don't replicate that well and my understanding is that that's been true of some of the um the discussed effects on moral judgment in terms mm -hmm. of olfactory stimuli and yeah. so on um uh, uh the you know the strength of those effects really remains to be determined over the long run, I would say. And 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 I think um, we can fairly characterize uh, the, the, the core features of your design that you presented as, as not being priming studies, but rather being judgment studies. Mm -hmm. um, and thus, uh, it's not really surprising that when you add a priming component to it, um, that priming component doesn't do very much because um, the the core structure is really, you know, people do X, mm -hmm. what do you think of people who do X? Mm -hmm. um, and there's no prime there. You're not trying to, to, to change some, you know, fundamental state of the individual. You're presenting them with information. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and and that might shed some light on on why the priming components maybe were not as uh, robust as the other parts of your own project mm -hmm. as well. Um, uh, I in in terms of the kind of the I would say the the broader picture on this. Um, I I don't know what Carlos Navarrete's positions on this are now. At the time that we were doing that work, we had a lot of discussions about this, but. Um, uh, my own position is that I'm quite skeptical that um, that disease avoidance 
um, is the that intergroup relations and disease avoidance um, are operating as the proper domain of one for the other, uh, and thus that um, that discussed as a component of xenophobia um, and ethnocentrism is probably not um, uh, the you know deep in the evolved psychological architecture, but yeah. rather is cultural evolution exploiting. Um, a foundation for negative appraisal. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, and I'm, I, I, I've published a bit in the past on, on my skepticisms about the parasite stress arguments about yes. um, in, intercultural differences in um, in pathogen loads and and ethnocentrism and so on. I think um, the the structure of ancestral human populations just would never have really supported. Um, uh, outgroup avoidance as a as a functional disease avoidance strategy yes uh, yes in fact i i didn't cite it but um in the manuscript i was thinking about including some work i'm curious what you think about it that i, I know there's some controversy around this but that folks think that in-group pathogens might actually be more threatening than outgroup ones yeah well i think there's a there's a more fundamental problem with that general line of reasoning which is um uh first of all we know that that um if we look at for example the movement of artifacts across large distances that that even predating our species there were trade networks that were pretty extensive um and um if that's the case then um then you have a a, a kind of um, public goods problem. And so if you and I are, are both um, potentially at disease risk by interacting with strangers who might carry unfamiliar pathogens um, and there are benefits to be had of interacting with them in the form mm -hmm. of trade and, and other you know, um, resources. Um, well, if I interact with them, I get the benefits and we both pay the costs because if I get sick, you get sick too, if we're in a small group, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and if you, you know, avoid interacting with them, then you don't get any of the benefits and you still pay the costs. Mm -hmm. So it's unclear that selection would ever favor that kind of avoidance. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think people vastly overgeneralized from contexts like the introduction of smallpox into North America by mm -hmm. Europeans. Yes, yes. Where, um, you know, you had the, you know, in, in ancestral environments in which the mind evolved, you, you would never have had a, a situation in which you had geographically disparate people suddenly juxtaposed in a way that allowed for the introduction of pathogens like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I think that the proper domain of the discussed component of intergroup psychology is really, um, you know, uh, the moral domain, the evaluation yeah. of the behavior of an outgroup um, yes. in terms of its failure to conform to the norms that structure in-group relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and that what your study is really getting at is that aspect of yeah. it and and that's why the cared for component that's a moral violation right that you're harming a cared for agent yes. Yes. Um, that's why it looms so large and i think um you know the relationship of of discussed culture and food is intimate but not because the you know the the food practices of another group posed a disease transmission risk mm -hmm. you know most foodborne illnesses mm -hmm. are foodborne they're, right. they're not in, easily interpersonally transmitted um right. uh, without exposure to body products like vomit or diarrhea or something like that um, uh -huh. um uh, you know so just being around someone who eats foods that put them at risk of illness doesn't necessarily put you at risk of illness it's That's being right. around them when they're sick that might um, right. and, and we're very sensitive to those body product, you know, materials as cues of, of, of transmission risk, right? We don't like feces and vomit, things like that. Um, so, you know, thinking about, well, those people disgust me because they eat something that is considered disgusting in my culture, right? Shouldn't really be a disease risk at all. It should right. be, they are violating some, you know, standard of behavior that serves an important coordination function um, uh, within my own community and 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 you know food is a is a, a kind of prototypical ethnic marker right i mean next to uh, adornment and ornamentation and language it's one of the things that that is most easily evident in terms of identifying the culture group to which someone belongs um, so uh, I, I actually think 
and it'd be, you know, like I said, I haven't talked to Carlos about this in years, but uh, so I don't know what his position on this is, but I, I, I find your results um, uh, quite gratifying actually, because it doesn't surprise me at all that people are distressed by the dog. It doesn't mm -hmm. surprise my dogs either, there they are back there. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, uh, and not particularly by the rat, right? Yeah. That is, um, uh, despite the stronger disease associations with yes. the rat and the dog. In fact, when I, I don't know if you've read the latest in Bar and Pizarro article, and they, they talk about, you know, your work, of course, um, and I noticed that they, they kind of say like the germ stuff, yeah, there's some evidence for it, but then they mention like that some of the studies, like I think it's a G article, uh, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, didn't actually replicate the germ effect, and then the fall article like two maybe only one study worked so I think they're kind of like also implying like maybe it's not sufficient enough yeah well I the, the trouble of course is that um you know by virtue of its phylogenetic you know um history moral disgust shares some of the qualia with um, with pathogen avoidance discussed and in related work, uh, Tom Cooper and I have shown that ectoparasite avoidance has some of the same, there's, there's overlap, there's shared, you know, wetware between all these systems that, that the adaptations are not distinct from each other in that way, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the, the way that they operate needs to be distinct. And I think that discussed researchers are frequently um, seduced by the similarity in the phenomenology, right? Well, people talk about being nauseated and, and, mm -hmm. and, and so on, right? Into thinking that that the that the proper domains are the same thing when they're not, right? So moral disgust is clearly a really powerful motivator in, um, you know, in in uh, punishing um, norm violators and in you know policing ethnic boundaries, uh, but the fact that it, you know, shares some of the subjective features with pathogen avoidance discussed doesn't mean that those functions have anything to do with pathogens mm -hmm. at all. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a part that is very complicated, but that I've been really trying to wrap my head around because, yeah, that's is a lot of yeah, just um, complex work on the distinction between moral disgust and pathogen disgust. Thank you for elaborating on that. Absolutely. I, I wonder how um, this work might intersect with research on disease spillover in the COVID-19 world and, mm -hmm. you know, renewed uh, awareness of the changing well, just growth and awareness of the epidemiological risks of different species. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing a minor bird flu outbreak right now. Um, of course, there's a lot to be learned about what kinds of uh, what kinds of uh, organisms can harbor COVID-19. But we know at least that um, it appears that deer can um, har harbor the, the the virus and potentially mm -hmm. pose a spillover risk. I wonder if there's any uh, intersection between your work and um, some of some of this epidemiological uh, mm -hmm. work going on around COVID nineteen and just a, the general global threat of disease spillover from wild populations. Anything along yeah. those lines that you've been thinking about? Yeah, I mean we um, we had once framed this paper in terms of COVID. Um, I think it's definitely relevant. It's tricky though, right? Because like, well. I don't know if this is exactly what you're asking, but like if you even look at the the comments on that, um, the, what I started showing is even though rat, at least as far as I know, or actually wait, no, dog, I'm thinking about this, even though uh, yeah, dog as far as I know isn't um, related to COVID, there was a lot of comments connecting. Asian people to the eating of dogs, implying that that was one of the drivers of COVID. Um, and I know, so so I don't know, it, it's tricky because like I know a lot of different animals have been implicated. Um, and I think, you know, some of them are probably not that high in care, like the, I don't even know how to say it, pet, pen, pangolin. Um, 
but um, but I think that that there is this kind of broader association with Asian people and dogs, and I wonder how much that is potentially driving the effect, even though there's not evidence for dogs being being the the source. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, I was just yeah along those lines. It's 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 a, kind of like a natural experiment where you can think of people have their folk notions of what yes. animals might have higher disease or moral threat. Yes. And then you can lay on top of that sort of this, these last two years in which people have now be, had, I guess, more attention focused on the disease threat of different organisms. Totally. And, and you could see if that has shifted beliefs in any way about acceptability of consumption or even just being around right. versus, you know, and then it gets complicated too, because the disease risk might also find its way into a moral judgment as well. Like you, mm -hmm. if you are putting yourself at risk for exposing yourself to a, a pathogen right. that that might have its own independent moral dimension that you know would factor into people's judgments. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, thank you. I know it would be interesting to test this now and see if it could be the effects might be different. Yeah. Anyone else have any other questions for Sasha? Dan, is that your hand from fire? Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll just yeah. follow up briefly on that, that exchange just now. So just to kind of clarify some of the things that I said earlier, it, 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 it's patently obvious, one doesn't have to be you know, a, a, a disgustologist to recognize this, that, that disgust is often marshaled in, in xenophobic and ethnogra ethnocentric propaganda, right? And has for a long time, right? And, and in genocidal contexts, the victims of genocide are often described in, you know, analogous to, to you know, animals and, and insects that are considered vectors for disease. Um, that doesn't mean, that means that this is a powerful emotion that can be leveraged to, you know, to marshal hostility against another group. It doesn't mean that our disease avoidance psychology naturally attends to group identity as one of the cues of disease risk. Right, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and I think that's another source of confusion. Right, so um, uh, you know, um, outgroup members are in 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 propaganda and 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 you know, prejudicial stereotypes are often described using a, a whole host of different pejorative, you know, emotion eliciting um, uh, uh, comparisons. So mm -hmm. to, to beasts and to, you know, um, to, to, um, you know, infanticidal creatures and to, 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 you know, um, sexual assailants and so on. Right. And these are all things that stir very strong emotions in people, but, uh, you know, the, the, the scholar who seeks to understand the phenomenon needs to differentiate how much of those are, you know, um, affordances of the evolved mind that make those kinds of ideas, you know, um, uh, attractive, as it were, that make it give, give propagandists leverage over, you know, a market of minds, right? Versus those are actually what those evolved mechanisms are designed to do. And I think too often people, especially in evolutionary psychology, mistake the former for the latter, mm. right? Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of full-blown evolutionary perspective is one that takes cultural evolution very seriously and recognizes that convergent cultural evolution will happen by virtue of the, you know, the, the, the pan-human psychological architecture uh, on which cultural evolution can operate. So propagandists will hit again and again and again on exactly the same, you know, negative depictions of outgroups precisely because they work so well and they work so well just because the the um you know the basic architecture of the mind is the same for all those different populations mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point yeah that's that is a good point multiple ways to trigger people's feelings of negativity towards others all yeah, and, layered and on top of one another just bringing it back to COVID, i know this isn't like a um a, a positive way to to take this, but um, when we were thinking about framing this for COVID stuff, we did find a lot of quotes from politicians um, that were inaccurately connecting 
Asian people to the eating of dogs and rats as a explanation for COVID. Um, anyways, just a just a point that yeah, how how dangerous this stuff can be. Uh, this is I have one general point, and then maybe we'll let you uh, let let you go. Um, I, I was wondering in your exploration of this topic whether you've been able to find any reliable sources or review articles that do a careful job of surveying world cultures and just simply like listing foods that are considered a part of edible, the set of edible uh, animals and those which have some defined taboo uh, ascribed to them. Is, is there a, a global database of this sort that it seems like it would be really uh, a useful thing for organizing yeah. cross-cultural research on this topic? Is there anything that you've encountered that has done that Not work? Um, that I know of. I mean, the Rosen article tries to get at this a little bit with they they do test effects in India um, in one of their studies, um, but that's the only thing I can think of. But that I am focusing mostly in the psych literature, so maybe there is something out there in another, yeah. another area. Yeah, yeah so I, that, that paper on food taboos that Carlos and I published a number of years ago, um, we, I wouldn't say that it is it is comprehensive, Brian, the way that you were looking for, but the, the ethnographic spread is pretty broad. And the, the take home is that, you know, meat is about seven times more likely to be tabooed than, um, you know, vegetable uh, or fruit That's matter um, uh, or grain, right? So basically, plant foods are just very rarely tabooed. And, mm. and and that's an example of what I was talking about right now. We don't think most of those taboos are functional. A few of them are, but the vast majority of them are just noise. And they're noise because it's the consequence of cultural evolution operating on a psychology where, as Sasha said earlier, meat is particularly salient. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, there's also a paper. I'm going to be embarrassed if it's yours, Daniel, and I don't remember, but uh, it's called like Meat, Milk, and Matzah. It's in cult cross <laughs> in cultural cross journal of cross cultural psychology, and they get at some of this stuff too. Um, those are the only things I can think of. Yeah, I, I was looking for this issue when I was researching honey consumption norms, um, and I just I, I ended up just searching you know keywords in into eHRAF, which is the anthropology sort of clearinghouse for ethnographies that are. And but I, I was just wondering if there was a, a more effective way to go about that kind of thing. I, I wonder, since we have some time, Sasha, you had some slides describing some of your other work there sure. that you kind of skipped over at the end. I oh, think. yeah. I mean, we can. Um, um, sure. Yeah. I'll just really quick mention, you know, I've done some tr more traditional cross-cultural psych work. I started doing stuff on cognitive dissonance when I was in graduate school. This was with Shinobu Kiyama. Um, and then I got more interested in work on social rejection. Um, this was some data I collected in Japan, actually going there. There's a really great, you know, just for the students here, there's a program called NSF EPSI, East Asian Pacific. I don't totally remember the acronym, but um, I got funding to do research in Japan. If you have a collaborator in Japan or various other, um, countries in that region, including Australia and stuff like that, they provide really great summer funding to go and, and, and do that work. And so this first paper you see, um, and this is my host family, uh, I collected the data there. And then this one is more recent, but with, with some collaborators in Japan. So we have cross-cultural data here as well. So this is looking at social rejection and emotions. Um, then I, on the intergroup relations side, I looked quite a bit at different kinds of commonalities for ways of reducing conflict like can we emphasize religious commonalities as an effective way to reduce conflict or emotional similarities um and as part of this uh this was actually my dissertation stuff i i went to the middle east and collected data on genetic similarities so if we emphasize genetic similarities how might that be effective in reducing peace and conflict and then out of that, um, I started doing work on DNA ancestry testing and the consequences of it for both identity and intergroup relations. And I did get a, a smallish grant from National Geographic, and these are my students doing it in the lab. But it's it's sad to talk about kind of because we've it was severely interrupted by by COVID. Um, 
And so even though I spent an enormous amount of time on this line of research, looking at DNA ancestry testing, it was extremely complicated, extremely complicated to get the IRB, extremely complicated to do the whole thing. It's uh, uh, kind of an area that I'm trying to step away from because it, it's just been so, it was already so exhausting. And then with COVID, it really disrupted everything. Um, but I am hoping to publish some stuff on that soon. Um, so that's pretty much it. And yeah, I mean, like also if my students or Bhakti wants to say anything, like feel free. I, again, I really hope you guys will meet Alex there because he's coming there soon. Um, so yeah, and I'm happy to, I know that there was some discussion about me talking to students and I'm happy to talk to students if, if that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, if, if you have your contact information right there, so I'll, I'll have you know, anyone who would like to follow up with uh, Professor Kimmel, please please send her an email. Um, and, I, and I think we can uh, just look forward to welcoming your student and into the larger Beck community when they arrive. Yes. Uh, yes. You tell your student, if you're out there, join the Beck listserv um, <laughs> and you'll get uh, announcements for talks like this. And, and uh, we'll, we welcome your participation, of course, in all of this. Um, so I think uh, we'll just call this call this a day here, and and look forward to seeing your further work on this on this yeah. topic. And uh, and yet, any comments that people might have, um, if you don't mind emailing me, I'd be really grateful on this. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Sasha. Thank